Now, my own journey on this has been an interesting one. Um, I started off as the sort of stereotypical kind of shy nerd when I entered the industry about 13 odd years ago. And I had this realization that if I carried on like that, it wasn't going to be very good for my career. And so I said to myself, look, you've got to, you've got to do something about this. And the starting point, to give you an idea of, of what a, a low level I was starting from, one of the things I remember doing is forcing myself every morning to say hello to the receptionist. And that, was, that felt like a, a, a challenge for me. So I hope that most people in the room are starting from a somewhat less challenged starting point. But the, the big thing that I've learned from my personal journey, and that now as I've started looking into some of these fields we're going to talk about today, is the level of change that you can undergo personally in your skills and your enjoyment of this side of work. And so what I wanted to discover as I started to look into some of these fields, and Alice mentioned earlier, we should be studying psychology. And as best I can, as someone with a full-time job as a, as a nerd, I have tried to study some of these things in, in my spare time. And I've been really encouraged to find that this notion of uh, these key skills and aspects of our personality, I've been very pleased to discover that they are far more changeable than I had ever thought they were. And probably the most, you know, most people in the IT probably don't realize how changeable these things are. There's a, one of the fields that um, touches on this is this thing called positive psychology, which is this really seriously cool thing, uh, which I don't have a lot of time to talk about today. But one of the, the foundation books in that is a thing called Learned Optimism how you can permanently change your level of optimism. Uh, and, and you're like, wow, you know, who thought you could do that? You know, before that book was written, who thought that that was a, a, a valid and, and useful thing for a person to do? And so the level of change in this is potentially very large. Now, you can't change everything. The, the corresponding thing on happiness out of positive psychology is you can change about 40% of the happiness that you have in life. The other 60%, you probably can't do anything about it. When I first started looking into this, I, I, again, another part of my personal journey is that not only have I had to learn the stuff I've just been talking about, but I've had some real ups and downs in terms of the successes of my interactions with, with people at work. Some have been very successful and some have been just complete train wrecks. And I thought, okay, Agile says it's about individuals and their interactions. Surely this Agile movement can tell me how to do this stuff. So I jumped on Google and I found out this wonderful uh, collaboration page and nothing else. You know, there are thousands of things on tools and processes, you know, thousands of things that tell me how to do TDD, various factions of TDD, the mockists versus the classicists and the, the factions of the mockists. And, but when the manifesto was put together on the hills up there, you know, eight years ago, it was saying that this stuff here, this, this stuff right here is more important than processes and tools. And I definitely agree with the person who said earlier in the panel, Mike, that is Agile broken? And in this sense, I think it is broken. We're not putting emphasis in the right place here. We're talking and talking and talking about processes and tools when this is the thing that makes the difference. And we've always said it was the thing that made the difference. So I started to look elsewhere. And I discovered this thing called organizational behavior, which defines itself like this. And I read that definition, and I thought, man, this thing is people and their interactions at work. That's the thing. That's the thing I'm looking for. That's the thing that Agile is not telling me about. And there's positive psychology, and this is a very new thing where the two meet, two come together in this thing called positive organizational psychology. And there's not a lot of stuff out there, but it's touching on some of what I've talked about today. These notions that you can learn all sorts of stuff that is relevant to your ability to have a successful interpersonal relationship at work. And so this political skill at work is a, is a fascinating thing. Now normally political has some kind of negative connotation to it. But basically what these guys are talking about is kind of the, the good side of the force, so to speak. And the idea that you can learn how to influence people you know, for good at work. And the interesting thing that they teach, and I was relieved to find it because I wanted to tell you guys this is true, and um, so I had to find out whether it was, is that you can learn this stuff, this business of being able to influence colleagues or managers more successfully than you do now, to sell an idea or to interact, is by and large a learnable skill. And yet, so much of the industry, including the part of the industry that we're in, is not necessarily investing enough effort in this. You know, it's perfectly normal for geeks to talk about doing their Microsoft certifications or their Java certifications, but who even talks about learning this stuff? Who even knows that you can learn this stuff? Um, uh, you know, if you don't think you can learn it, of course you're not going to talk about it, of course you're not going to try. And so one of the things that I hope comes out of, of this talk here today is that when we go back to our, our various places of work, 
you know, there'll be people sitting on adjacent desks to you who are like I was 10 or 15 years ago. Geeks who think they can't do this and who don't know it's learnable. And if we can take some of this message back to them, I think that could be a really, really powerful thing. There's this guy who's done a lot of research on expertise. What does it become? What does it take to become an expert in tennis, in some other sport, in the, you know, computer programming, or in interpersonal interaction? And what he's found is this uh, several key notions. The one I'm going to single out today is a thing called deliberate practice. And basically, that means not just accumulating a lot of years of experience under your belt, but learning. So if I go down to a tennis court and I do the same bad serve 20 times in a row, I haven't learned. If I do my bad serve the first time and I reflect on how I could do it better and I do it slightly better and I keep doing that cycle, that's deliberate practice, or at least in my naive understanding of it, that's deliberate practice. And the thing he finds with this is that it does take time. The same research says it takes 10 years to become an expert. And you know, I've talked a bit about my journey with this and I'm not an expert on this yet, but certainly it's taken me a number of years. So none of this, this is not a thing you take away and shabang, it's wonderful. This is a process you take away, you can start to put into place and it will bear fruit over the course of months and years. But when I first started trying to learn this uh, some time ago, I read a book on you know, how to be a leader in a technical field and I felt like it was saying, John, you're like this and good technical leaders, well, they're like that. And I'm like, well, you know, it was sort of almost offensive to suggest I should have to have some kind of personality transplant and it, it seemed unlikely to succeed. And, and it really put me off, and I actually uh, said, well, I don't want to be a technical leader then. And the interesting thing that comes out of the management research, completely independent from, from Agile, is that the best managers, you know, just managers in general, are not trying to conform to some stereotype of who a manager is. They are being themselves more skillfully. And this, again, is this learnable skill, uh, you know, authentic leadership. And it takes the pressure off this whole notion that we can learn to do this stuff better. If you say to yourself, and it's true, the goal here is to simply be a more skillful version of myself, but the pressure's off. You're not trying to give yourself a personality transplant. You're not trying to conform to something that's completely different. You're actually trying to do the thing that will work for you, and happens to be the best way to lead and motivate anyway. This is not about the people who are on your old chart. This is about the stuff that happens to the people who are not even on the org chart, the people who sit cutting code, the people who sit at their desks and don't talk to their developers, her fellow developers, the people who sit at their desks and talk too much and push their opinions around. And I've been in both those camps and I'm trying to learn to step out of them into a, a more positive territory. So this is, this is not org chart management -y stuff. This is about empowering the teams. This is not also necessarily about training courses. The great thing about this deliberate practice stuff is that you can learn it by yourself. One of the, the interesting stories I came across was a CEO, 35 years old, in charge of this big company, and he got there on the back of his interpersonal skills. And they said, how did you do that? And he said, how did you build those skills? And he said, every meeting, when I came out of the meeting, I'd come back to my desk, I'd get a notebook, and I'd write down essentially lessons learned from that meeting in terms of interpersonal interaction. Now, he basically never read this notebook. But it was a mini personal kind of retrospective thing, like we do in Agile, you know, the end of iterations. This was this little thing after each meeting. And that took him to a point where he was in, you know, this very important successful position on the back of his interpersonal skills, which he had built that way. And certainly for me, I've not gone down the notebook route, but I've certainly found that deliberate practice, even without a, a mentor or a buddy, is a powerful, powerful thing. So you can learn this. People in the team, you know, teams can learn this, individuals can learn this. You don't need, you know, high-flying consultants. You don't need, you know, team-building courses with ropes and swings over bridges and stuff. Uh, so, and the other thing is that it does take, take time in this notion of building expertise. There's an element of, of time and patience involved, but there's a great, great payoff at the end.